Hello, PsychU community, and welcome to today's webinar, Technology and Mental Health, Role of the Treatment Team. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Mark Takalowski, and I am a medical science liaison for Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization Incorporated. I'm going to be serving as the moderator for today's discussion featuring Dr. Jake Behrens and Dr. Daniel Carlin. This presentation is sponsored by Otsuka and Lundbeck. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Behrens to get us started. I know a lot of this will be keeping kind of at a, at a general level, but hopefully some, some concepts in here that, that we can help talk through. One of the things we want to be able to get here is just what are the needs for a lot of these changes that we'll be talking about. So much of it is just the peer, as we all know, the, the inadequate um, access that so many have to mental health, both in our country and globally. Just looking at here is, you know, you know from estimates all quoted there in the bottom, in a 20 to 50% of adults in the U.S. with you know, serious conditions not being able to get care, um, even larger discrepancy going worldwide. Um, and then up here, even so many, of, even if they have access to care, are people able to keep up with it? Can they, can they adhere to everything that goes into it? Not just do they take their treatment, but can they keep up with the ongoing needs to stay with that treatement? And this is, you know, bipolar, schizophrenia, many different conditions studied in many different ways. I just want to be able to dive into some more data on this and look at some potential ways that we can that we can help adjust to it as we continue to evolve our, our the ways that we deliver care. We'll walk through this, this kind of building block slide here, but looking at a lot of the barriers that, that both um, from the patient and a provider standpoint. But in this case, you know, it's just starting at the financial side, um, that from the the patients just being able to access. Obviously, first and foremost, do they have access financially to be able to, to get to the types of care? Do their their services are they provided? Are there is there um, the ability to get in their current provider network and their insurance network to be able to have access, or are they able to find other ways to, to get it outside of the traditional healthcare system? And here, you know, one out of three, they're simply not able to engage with it. Like, do they have access? Do they want to get access? Do they have the, the physical ability to be able to get in to engage, be that cognitively, logistically? And in here, simply the stigma is just something that people feel comfortable reaching out for help. Um, do they reach out to family and friends? They would for other conditions. Do they reach out to primary care or the general medical establishment? Are they looking for different ways, more secure or less areas, less filled with stigma? Like in what ways are people more likely to reach out for, for such conditions? And are we truly meeting people kind of where, where they are in their, in, in whatever the ways that they do want to um, kind of receive care or help? See in here, if people know in the general psychiatric time in our healthcare system, huge wait times. Or many times it makes it so if people actually are, are at the point of wanting help, can we strike while the iron's hot? Um, are they able to get in in timely appointments, not just for new evaluations, but even for follow-up? If they have questions, if they have further needs or reasons to have to be able to adapt or be responsive to changes going through, do, do we have the availability in our the current kind of model and how it works for both evaluations and for follow-up. And then we're tracking, like, are we able to actually follow through to see are patients keeping up with treatments? Are they able to, are, can we be as effective as we can outside of those appointments? When we do have appointments, do we have all the data that we need to be as effective as possible in those moments uh, to be able to make adjustments or to be there to help support our, kind of our, our patients or for loved ones to be able to support those who, who they support? And then in here, just simply provider access. Um, you know, as we are, certain people can provide certain types of care. They're going to have in a um, synchronous-based model. There's going to be limited appointment slots, and that's in our other way of geographically based in you know individual state medical license rules that we have in our country. Is do we have adequate distribution? It's not even do we have enough people across the country, but in the place where, where patients do require it. Um, do, do we have kind of access? Do we have the providers? Do we have wh whatever way for people to get care when and wh where and when they need it? And we know that that's, there's definitely a shortage, but if you break it down geographically, it becomes even, even larger because we have such discrepancy in our distribution. See in here, we come to you know, many different digital technologies to try and help to address this. This is just kind of a starting place, a few general concepts of ways that if we think about this in other ways of what does it take for us to be able to get what does a patient need? What's going to be some of the, the easiest, most 
responsive, lowest cost ways of being able to obtain that. Um, or like finding ways to be more cost effective, to make it more engaging in a faster, easier, sooner way that they that that people can get help they need when they need it. Is it make it easier because there's less stigma involved? The le the fewer people they have to interact with in that. Um, do we have ways that we can track this over time to have data available? So when people do actually have access to an expert or someone that can support, do they have everything already collected, ready to go so we can be more efficient and hopefully as more effective as we can with the limited times that we do have with, um, with those that we care for? And we just want to be able to make it is obviously with provider access, it doesn't have to all be about this patient, this provider, and that's the only time where care happens, what can we do here to facilitate teams, to bring other people in, to facilitate not just an interaction with a, with a given um, medical professional, but what do we do to be able to really expand our need with, with, uh, with team-based rules? And here, I'll pass this off to Dr. Carlin. If it's getting into you know, some more, we talk about digital technology, which is a very broad term, so look to get here into a little bit more you know, examples of this. Thanks so much, Jay. It's really important to follow on what uh, Jake was just saying, is that when we start to talk about digital, it's easy to, to sort of fly away uh, from traditional methods and means of providing care. And it's absolutely critical that as we consider what digital can do, that we consider it in the context of the reality of care provision. Digital can't move the entire method means places uh, people who provide care and who receive care in a direction without first engaging with, with those realities. And so what we see here follows directly from what we just heard, which is that when we start thinking about digital, we have to think about existing both opportunities and barriers. What you see here is I would say a very optimistic map of the treatment team, that if someone really had a very robust set of health services around them, they might have all of these different folks helping them to ensure that they get the best care they can for the conditions they present with. Now, this is sort of a mixture of roles that an individual might play and individual credentials that someone might have, right? So there's always this mix of what is someone capable of doing and what role are they asked to play? And so in a, in a uh, chart like this, you might think the clinical social worker, maybe the therapist, maybe the case manager, maybe doing stuff that a nurse could do, uh, the psychiatrist could be the therapist, that, that these, these different credentials don't necessarily imply a role. One amazing opportunity that we see with the use of better care coordination and digital technology is how can we help folks work at the best place they can be from a credentialing perspective in the roles that they play, right? How do we help people to work, as we say, at the top of their license? And so when we think about the advantages of a coordinated care team, often what that does is enable uh, different providers to provide the best services they are able to while not having to spend valuable time of theirs and, and time, of course, that they have with the patient doing services that could maybe be better provided by someone with a different level of training, different, uh, different ability to provide care. And, and so by assigning the right tasks to the right person, we make care more efficient and likely more high quality. And that's reflected in this study that's cited on the right side of the slide here, where we see that compared to patients receiving treatment for depression without a coordinated care team, those with comprehensive care received more treatment, which may or may not be a good thing, but they had greater improvement in depression symptoms, which we can all agree is a good thing. And ultimately, were more satisfied with their care. What kind of technologies might a team use to coordinate care? So we'll start with the, the sort of the oldest here, which is electronic health records, right? The EHR has long been the, the vanguard of, of digital tech. Uh, we have EHRs going back 50, 60 years now. EHRs have, of course, become ubiquitous in many care settings, though psychiatry has lagged behind in the, uh, in the domain of individual care providers who may still use familiar paper to record notes. Uh, for a long time, we thought electronic health records were going to be intrinsically better than paper, that they necessarily would make things more efficient and safer. And of course, that hasn't played out exactly as we thought it, it might have. While EHRs 
do reduce certain types of, of mistakes, errors, and, and can increase coordination of care, they also can systematize types of mistakes and errors in a way that they weren't systematized before. So the, even the transition to electronic health records and the progression of electronic health records can't be taken for granted to be a good thing. Right? We have to do these, these uh, changes carefully with good change control, good training, and good engagement with the care team. Technology to coordinate care for patient assessment. So if you think about the ability for patients to conduct uh, EPRO or, or self-report assessments via a piece of technology instead of via paper, that may introduce economies where instead of now a piece of paper having to be put in a folder that someone may or may not look at, the assessment that someone conducts could be automatically integrated into the electronic healthcare record. So now when the provider, whatever provider they may be, is sitting and looking at the data about a patient that they would ordinarily access, they can access some new bits of information like structured assessments. A web-based tracking and decision aids, so the idea that we can bring to providers uh, decision support, and again, more information about both the uh, potential treatments that might be brought to a patient and the effects that those are having on the patient, and, and maybe even in real time, right? So if someone in their life is completing additional assessments, not just doing an assessment on the rare occasion when they visit uh, a medical office, right? Because though for those of us who work in medical offices, it doesn't feel like a rare occasion we're in a medical office. For the vast majority of folks who are not healthcare providers, going to the doctor's office is a really small part of their life, right? Going to the, to the, the therapist's office, Though it may be weekly for an hour, they have so much life that's outside of the office that can maybe be captured in these other tools. And finally, at the bottom right there, we see a really important um, safety intervention, which is better structured capture of suicide risk. Suicide remains a, a leading cause of death, uh, an often overlooked and in many ways stigmatized cause of death. But the more that we are able to do reproducible and structured capture of suicidality data, the more likely we are to provide life-saving intervention at a time when someone most needs it. 